So 11.3, this section, is going to really um, bring kind of what we were hinting at in 11.1, .1, bring it kind of all together, where we can actually, I mean, this is a big deal, you guys. <laughs> we can actually say that a function is equal to an infinite series. And not only an infinite series, but like an infinite polynomial. Um, so the table on 740 gives you a bunch of the different um, Taylor series representations for some really common functions. I mean, it's kind of a big deal. We're saying that we can write sine of x equal to a polynomial, infinite polynomial, but equal to a polynomial. So, so it's pretty awesome. Um, so let's kind of work with this a little bit and see, just do a couple of examples. And then we'll uh, call it good. So the function I have here is f of x equals 1 over x squared. And let's just start with a. Find the first four terms of the Taylor series centered at a equals negative 1. So what I like to do is I like to um, go back to the definition of the Taylor series, right, which is f of a plus f primed of a times x minus a plus f double primed of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared plus the third derivative evaluated at a over 3 factorial times x minus a cubed. And I think that's our first four terms, right? And then, of course, if it's a series, it just goes on forever. So as we look ahead here, so I want to find those first four terms, but then I also want to find summation notation for it. So I want to see if I can kind of um, notice a pattern, right, as I'm writing out these terms. So what I know I need, I know... Um, so I have, I know what f of x is. f of x is x to the negative 2. I know I'm going to take the derivative, so I'm going to rewrite it like that. Um, and I need some derivatives, right? So f primed of x is a negative 2x to the negative 3. f double primed of x, and I'll be putting in negative 1 here in a minute, is 6x to the negative 4. And then the third derivative, right, would be, oh, there should be an x in there, is a negative 24x to the negative Five. Now let's evaluate this at negative 1. So at negative 1, that's 1 over negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared is a positive 1, right? f primed of negative 1. When I cube negative 1, that's a negative, and then I have a negative 2, so that'll be a positive 2. f double primed of negative 1, right? You can see what this is, you know, what's happening here. As I take it to the fourth power, that's positive, so that's just going to be 6. And then the third derivative evaluated at negative 1 will be a positive 24 because negative 1 to the fifth power is a negative. Okay, so I think I can find my first four terms. Well, I know I can find my first four terms. So my first four terms are going to be, so f of a is 1, then plus um, 2 times x minus a. x minus a negative 1 is x plus 1. And then I'm going to have plus 6 over 2 factorial times x plus 1 squared, and then finally plus 24 over 3 factorial times x plus 1 cubed. So those are my first four terms, and I would, of course, you know, if I were to write down my final answer, I would simplify that 6 over 2 factorial and that 24 over 3 factorial, of course. I think, actually, man, I'm noticing a pretty cool pattern here. I haven't actually done this problem, but 2 factorial is just 2, so this is 3 times x plus 1 squared, and then um, 24, so 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. 24 divided by 6 is 4, hmm, plus 1 cubed. This is interesting, right? So if we did, you know, I want to find a pattern, because I know part b. If I did the fourth derivative, the fourth derivative, would be 120x to the negative 6. If I put in a negative 1, that's just 120. And if I take 120 and divide it by 4 factorial, oh man, I need a calculator. Um, 4 factorial is 24, and 120 divided by 24, what do you know? It's 5. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out what my pattern is going to be, right? Because I want to write the summation notation for it, and that's usually the hardest part. Now this right here, is my answer. I just did one more term right here to kind of see if I notice a pattern. And sure enough, there is a pattern, right? This, um, if I look at the 
exponent of my x plus 1, that 2 is always 1 more than it. If this 3 is 1 more than the 2, this 4 is 1 more than the 3, and notice this 5 is 1 more than the 4. So mathematics is about patterns. This is basically asking you to find a pattern. So part B then, if I'm looking at summation notation, so part B, I usually want to start from k equals 0. That's always usually where we want to start. Well, what do I know? I know I'm going to have x plus 1 to the kth power, right? If when k is 0, if I put in 0 for k, I get that first term right there, which is that 1. When k, now let's think about what we're going to have here, right? So, um, oh, easy there. So, what do I know? I know that this number in front of the x plus 1 is always 1 more than the exponent. So what's 1 more than k? Well, that would be k plus 1. And I think that's going to work. Let's, let's check. If k is 0, I get 0 plus 1, which is 1. x plus 1 to the 0 is 1, so that works. Plus, when k is 1, right, I get 2 times x plus 1. That was a fun one. When k is 2, I get 2 plus 1, which is 3, times x plus 1 squared, and so on and so forth. So yeah, yeah I'm pretty confident in um, my summation notation that I have found for part b. Good, and then determining the integral of convergence, we're just going to go back to what we did in the last section. So here is, this is my series right here, and I want to know what x values will make this converge. So I'm going to go ahead and do... Um, I'm going to do the ratio test, right? So I'm going to take the kth plus 1 term. So I'm going to replace that k right there with a, with a k plus 1, right? And then I have the x plus 1 to the k plus 1, okay? All over the kth term, which is just, you know, what's given right there. So again, I hope, you, I hope you understand, right? I took this k right here and I replaced it with k plus 1. That would be the kth plus 1 term. Now, sometimes those little things get you, you know? So um, what does this give me then? Well, uh, I can cancel out these x plus 1 k. This is horrible notation, and I'm going to have 1 left over. So that'll be x plus 1 absolute value. I can bring that outside of the limit because the limit um, isn't affected by the x, or the x's aren't affected by the limit, I should say. All right, and then what's happening to this? And I don't need absolute values. I know k is positive. Um, so I think this way is not going to 0. What is this all going to? 1, right? Because I have the k divided by k. So when is this going? So remember, this guy converges as long as we're less than 1. So my interval of convergence, I want x plus 1 to be less than 1, which what does that imply? That implies that x plus 1 is going to be between negative 1 and 1. Subtract the 1. I get what is my, my possible interval interval? of convergence, right, is negative 2 to 0. And I don't think we're going to include either one of those endpoints, but let's just check. So if x is negative, wow, wow, if x is negative 2, okay, then what, I'm going to put that x equaling negative 2 into um, my series here, and I get k plus 1 times negative 1 to the Okay, well guys, this is a pretty simple divergence test. Um, notice the limit as k approaches infinity of k plus 1 equals infinity, which is not equal to 0. If that the kth term isn't 0, then there's no way it's going to converge. I mean, even that negative 1 to the k, right? So it's not absolutely convergent. That's kind of what I've shown. But it, still, if the kth term doesn't go to 0, it's not going to pass your alternating series test. All right? So that you need to be kind of aware of those differences. Um, if x is 0, I get 1 to the k. Um, when I plug that in up here, uh, 1 of k is just 1, so I get k plus 1. So same reasoning as above, right? The limit of this term. This guy's getting huge as, I, as k gets big. That's infinity is clearly not equal to 0, so here it diverges. Here it diverges. So what is my interval then? My interval then is just negative 2. My interval of convergence is negative 2 to 0, not including my endpoints. Good. This, I think when you're working with these Taylor series, um, the hardest part I, 
I think is kind of seeing this notation right here is like kind of figuring out that summation notation. And what you want to look for are patterns. So you want to kind of look and see how are my exponents related. Um, sometimes with the fact, you know, the factorials up here, um, stuff will cancel out. Sometimes it doesn't, but um, you know, if it does, then then you have something to go on. All right, so let's move on to another example, and this will be the last example for the um, lecture. Um, this has to deal with binomial series. So remember binomial coefficients, right, which they, the definition of those is, was discussed. Um, the P and K, sometimes they say like P choose K, but it's a little bit different than P can be a real number. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a, what am I trying to say? I can't write and do this at the same time, people. Um, it does not have to be a whole number. Like we used to, like if you've done anything with combinatorics, like um, probability, we in the past have had to have that, and now we don't have to have that, okay? Um, so P choose K, or however you want to think of that, right? This is the this is how we're going to find that. And you, if you looked at the binomial expansion that was given to you in the book, right, we saw that this was going to be the binomial series for, right, um, a function like this. Okay, and this would be centered at zero, of course. And then what do we? Sh what did they show? They showed that this guy right here, if you start plugging in all those numbers, is one plus p x k okay, plus p times p minus one, right, all over two factorial x squared plus p times p minus one times p minus two. So we're just taking one away every single time. So what I kind of think about is as I'm doing this, you know, I should have as many terms, you know, if I have two factorial, I should have two terms on top. If I have three factorial, I should have three terms on top. So it's basically how many ones I'm pulling off um, as I work through it. And they kind of went through that for you with the binomial series. And where does this come from? It comes from when you take the derivative, right, with the power, with the power rule. We bring that down and we take one away. And so that's kind of where it comes from. Now this will be an infinite series as long as um, P is a non, or excuse me, as long as um, P is not a non-negative integer. If it is a non-negative integer, meaning a positive um, integer or a whole number, uh, I should be a little careful there, but uh, it'll eventually go to zero because when you keep taking this P minus 2, P minus 1, eventually that, you know, the P is going to eventually go to zero. Okay, so in this case, let's kind of use this guy right here to find our first four terms. So in our case, p is two-thirds, right? Because what is the function that we are dealing with? We're dealing with one plus x to the two-thirds. So p is two-thirds. So now I'm just gonna write this in. So what is my the first four terms of my Taylor polynomial going to be, or my binomial series, excuse me, going to be one plus, so I'll have two-thirds x, right, plus, two-thirds times two-thirds minus one over two factorial x squared plus two-thirds times two-thirds minus one times two-thirds minus two. I don't know if you can hear my cat. My cat is really wanting to get into my room. Um, so that's four terms right there. And now, of course, we don't want to leave it like that. So let's simplify this a little bit. So I get two-thirds x, um, two-thirds minus one, that's a negative one-third times two-thirds, right, would be a negative two-ninths. And then what is that? Two, fact, two factorial is just two, so I'm going to multiply by one-half. So I get minus two-eighteenths x squared. Um, same thing here. I know this right here I just figured out was a negative two-ninths times two-thirds minus two. That's six-thirds, so that'd be times a negative four-thirds. And then three factorial is one-sixth. So I could simplify a little here. That two goes in three times. So it looks like to me we get eight. Don't quote me on this, maybe 80 once, 80 first, 80 once, 80 first. And this is the first four terms of the binomial, binomial series for, you know, a, again, I just think this is amazing for this function that has an exponent of two thirds. Um, 
that's a complicated function. I mean, if you're doing some stuff with it and right now, you know, I have a approximating function with only four terms, but you know, whatever. All right. So now what's the last thing we want to do? We want to approximate, and this will be the last example, 1.02 to the two thirds using that, those first four terms. All right. And so if I look at this one plus X, well, how do I get 1.02? I take one plus 0 0.02, right? So this polynomial here that I have, that's going to basically approximate this number for me, what is X going to be? It's going to be 0 0.02 because that's what I would have to add. Whoa. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So that's what I would have to add, right? That would be my X value in my original function. So I'm going to plug that in, right? 0 0.02 minus, oh, 2 18ths. Why did I leave that as 2 18ths? You're probably wondering the same thing, huh? One ninth, 0 0.02 squared, plus I don't think 8 and 81 simplify, I'm pretty sure, um, 0 0.02 cubed, and we get about 1.01328967 Now if I actually took 1.02 and I raised it to the two thirds, the actual um, 1.02 to the two thirds, which is the cube root of it and then squared, is 1.01328927. So look, you guys, just those first four terms of the binomial series gives me, and you see that this is, whoops, went too far. This is very, very similar, right, to what we did in 11.1, .1, but I match up to six decimal places. Like, that's. Good enough for government work, right? I can say that I worked for the government for a time. <laughs> that's just a joke. Please don't take offense. All right, so that's the big thing. I, I would like you to please look over the stuff about remainders um, in, in the last part of in the last part of this section. Uh, do you really believe, right, that that, for instance, well, I mean, e to the x, right? Do you really believe that we can say that e to the x is just this guy. I just love this one, right? And this, and this, you guys, is for, this converges for all x values, no matter what. Um, so I just, this one is pretty amazing to me. Do you really believe that I can say e to the x is equal to that? So the remainder theorem, Taylor's theorem, we show that that remainder goes to zero. And that's how we, that's how you really prove that. I'm not going to have you actually prove that on the test, but it's an important concept to read through and understand. And of course, if you have questions, let me know.